After 48 years together, the United Kingdom and the European Union are officially apart. So, how's it going so far? Hello, I'm Arnold Neider and this is The Heat. Few divorces are ever easy. It took four years for Brexit to happen and a number of difficult issues still remain to be resolved. But one week into the new year, in the middle of a pandemic that's led to another lockdown, the United Kingdom is now officially independent of the European Union. CGTN's Andrew Wilson has more from Oxford. Brexit, as the Prime Minister would like to put it, may be done. But the deeper changes ushered in by UK independence draw a far longer term picture. A trade deal has been agreed, so a quick look at the key ports of Dover, Belfast or Calais by and large show the sailing's been smooth, but that's with the usual traffic much reduced by the holiday weekend. A lot of bigger firms have done their preparation, but many smaller companies are telling a different story with hundreds of online traders in the UK and Europe temporarily refusing to ship goods across the channel in either direction. It's uncertainty about paperwork, about tax and customs declarations, all of which can affect pricing. Outside the much celebrated trade deal, which focused essentially on fisheries and protecting the EU single market, lie the deal details that negotiators were only too happy to kick down the road and now have to deal with. There's security information sharing in policing and anti-terror operations. There's recognition of professional qualifications. Can a UK certified lawyer or indeed ski instructor practice in France, for example? There's the free flow of data, a stream that's multiplied hugely in the past decade and flows unchecked in the case of UK EU servers. And there's the financial sector. Uh, there was plenty of pre-Brexit speculation that jobs would flee the city of London to positions in Europe, but that hasn't really happened. London enjoys a unique position between Wall Street and the EU as the international heart of banking, credit swaps, insurance and capital transfers. And there are signs that the sector in general may want it to keep that role. Brussels needs to legislate on this, and soon. Negotiations have started with hopes for at least a memorandum of understanding in banking by March this year. The negotiating teams may have had a break for Christmas, but by now, a lot of them will be back behind their desks again. Andrew Wilson, CGTN, in Oxford. There is much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Klaus Laures joins us from Raleigh, North Carolina. He's a distinguished professor of history and international affairs at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Garrett Martin is in Hilton Head, South Carolina. He's a senior professorial lecturer at American University School of International Service and co-director of the Transatlantic Policy Center. Wayne Fitzgerald is the deputy leader of the Peterborough City Council in the United Kingdom. And joining us from London is political analyst and the CEO of Blonde Money, Helen Thomas. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Helen, let me start with you. It's been a week since the United Kingdom left the European Union. Um, we just heard about some of the challenges that both sides now face uh, working out the details of this divorce. Um, how do you think it's going so far? Well, I suppose it could have been worse is one way of looking at it. Uh, I think the point here is we haven't seen an awful lot of pressure yet, as your correspondent mentioned, because uh, there's been much reduced traffic on some of the key trade routes. So uh, I think it's sort of steady as it goes, but with an expectation that the real challenges are going to come in the next few weeks. Would it be just weeks, Helen, or could we see this taking place over months, possibly uh, much longer? Well, if we look at just that key issue of the trade routes, you would hope that, uh, you know, sensible, practical minds will prevail. And when they come up against the stumbling blocks, they will quickly work together to resolve them. But of course, in the mix of all of this is the intensification of the pandemic. That in itself is going to cause problems in supply chains. So uh, I think the truth is it will be quite a long and rocky road, not just because of this new trade negotiation, but that the economics of it all is, is coming under a lot of strain from the intensification of the pandemic.
Klaus Lares, of course, as we know, this was not an easy negotiation. It took place over a very long time, over years. Uh, what is the feeling in the EU now that the United Kingdom has left? I mean, were there winners and losers in this? Well, I mean, this was indeed a very difficult uh, divorce and everyone is relieved that a trade deal was achieved. And as you know, uh, that trade deal was only achieved a few days before the absolute uh, deadline when some people had already given up hope. So indeed, it could have been worse without such a, a trade deal. But there is a great disillusionment that um, Britain had to leave or felt it had to leave the EU. And on the whole, I believe Johnson really, uh, Prime Minister Johnson has three tasks uh, uh, ahead of him that would be one to design a comprehensive economic strategy because he always said that the UK will be better off after leaving the EU. So we now really need to see something like a detailed economic strategy. Then after having for four years looked internally at the UK, the UK having been really obsessed with itself, it now really needs to develop a more global approach and needs to really balance its reputation in the world and become uh, more of an international uh, power again. And thirdly, and not lastly, uh, Johnson really has to, uh, to, to keep the UK together, because there's a real danger that Northern Ireland will merge with the Republic of Ireland and that Scotland wants to become independent. And it will be very difficult for Johnson to explain to the Scottish why it's good for Britain and the UK to leave the European Union, mm -hmm. but it's bad for Scotland to leave the UK. And to convince the Scottish that it is good for them to stay in the UK, that is quite a challenge which he will face. And um, the pandemic doesn't help. You know, the, the leadership of Johnson in the pandemic is uh, not great, to put it that way. Some people say he is uh, really quite incompetent. And the Scottish people are getting fed up with that. And there is a real desire to leave the UK behind itself and to rejoin the EU as an independent country. And just to get back to my final, my last part of my question there, uh, Klaus, were there any winners and losers in this? Um, this is difficult to say. I would say in the next few weeks, in the next few months, we will find out about it. Mm -hmm. But I would say that on the whole, the UK is, of course, a much uh, a smaller power. It has a population of 67 million. The EU has over 400 million. So it is clear that the balance of power lies with the EU rather than with the UK. But uh, the UK will have a few advantages, but also huge disadvantages from having left uh, the EU. Wayne Fitzgerald, we just heard Klaus tell us there about some of the challenges that uh, the British Prime Minister will be facing in the months and years ahead. One of them, of course, being that it could lead to the breakup uh, of the United Kingdom. What is your view on that? Well, and, um, since I was last here in December, the world didn't stop on the 31st. It wasn't Armageddon. We are alive, well and kicking in the UK. And Klaus has said again, he said it last time I was on, you know, the fact is, the UK is the fourth largest country in the world in terms of its power, in terms of finance. You know, this is all going really well for the UK. Inevitably, there will be hiccups as new systems bed in, technology takes time to uh, fit into the new structures. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, Boris Johnson has done an enormously successful job when people said he couldn't do it. You know, you ask about winners and losers. I don't like to look at it like that. I've said before, we're all friends. The UK's got the deal it wants. Mm -hmm. And the EU must also work with us as trading partners. And I don't see that it's a bad thing for anybody. You know, we are a nation of traders. I said that last time. Right. Wayne, one of the biggest post-Brexit challenges, if I could put it that way, is immigration. Uh, this would mark the end of free movement of people between the United Kingdom and the European Union. It also redefines skilled versus low-skilled workers. Um, how likely is this, uh, I mean, how will it impact the US econ UK economy? Look, let's be clear about immigration. The UK has always been an arms open, welcoming country. We've been like that for hundreds of years. But what we want is control of who comes into the country, so we say, rather than the EU says. It will put strains on the immigration system, but you know that's happening all over the world and throughout Europe. Europe has got its own problems. We have problems, for example, in the care sector, which I'm particularly involved in in the UK here. We need to keep a flow of 
immigration coming into Europe and into the UK in particular. So I don't think immigration in the long term is going to be a problem. It's just a question of having control over it, and that's what it's been about. Garrett Martin, how do you see this lack of free movement and other immigration changes uh, affecting the European Union? Because they, they're so enmeshed. There's been people moving across these borders now for, what, 40 years, uh, a long time. Well, you know, I think it goes back to your, the question you asked Klaus and Wayne as well about winners and losers. And I, you know, I'm going to take a slightly different tack here. I think, you know, it was interesting that both the UK and the EU were fundamentally negotiating to themselves in many respects. They were far more concerned about their internal dynamics in some respects than the actual negotiation with the other side. For the EU, the key about Brexit negotiations was keeping internal cohesion, and they did that very well. For the UK, the key was about having a conservative Brexit and about regaining sort of freedom. And so in that sense, I think they both won. They both got what they wanted from the Sin deal. I think the losers for me are the people. Uh, the people who are losing, I think, a very important element, that freedom of movement, which I think gave a lot of opportunities to people both in the UK and the EU. And so I think for, for a number of, of people for whom their profession requires that ability to move easily from the continent back to the UK, I think that's going to be very painful. Uh, there's a lot in the thin deal that hasn't been materialized, and there's going to be a lot of growing pains in the next few years in terms of working out the exact details of the new relationship between the UK and the EU. And I'm afraid that we may be stuck in Brexit eternity uh, for the next foreseeable future because there are a lot of elements of that long-standing partnership and relationship that need to be worked out. Wayne, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, in the short term, or even in the long term, the people lose out. I don't think so. The people clearly voted in this country to take back control of its borders. And again, I want to stress, you know, I consider that, you know, we have a culture here that welcomes people from all over the world. And I want that continu to continue. I also think it's necessary for our economy. We just have to work out the how to do that. You know, whether it's whether you're in working in teaching or science or security or, you know, you want to come and study. I think all those things, you know, we're kind of running before we're walking because it was a tortuous journey since 2016. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it ends here. You know, the, we talked, you, you mentioned your reporter from Oxford about the financial markets. Let's hope that gets sorted uh, by March. Right. Look, this, this is going to be a journey, and we're, we're only on the beginning of it. Helen, talking about financial markets, I mean, that is one area that was barely mentioned in the deal. Um, this is a sector which accounts for something like 7% of the UK's economy, 10% of its tax receipts. Um, you know, we know that London's financial markets have been major beneficiaries uh, when the UK was in the EU. What happens now? Well, it certainly is an important sector that needs to be thrashed out, as you say, absolutely integral to UK tax receipts. And, you know, in the current environment with economic growth under threat, uh, you know, you need to get that money in where you can. Uh, but having said all of that, the uh, financial services sector has had a long time to prepare for this. Uh, there's been a lot of dialogue between the regulators, between the Bank of England and the European Central Bank. Uh, there are clearly going to be shifts. I mean, already staff have been moved to places like Dublin or Luxembourg for companies that wanted to uh, need to have a presence on the ground in the EU. Um, and I think, you know, no one should be under any illusion that there is a break here and, and there is a shift in uh, the way the regulation works. Um, mm -hmm. Having said all of that, uh, London has, I think Wayne has mentioned, you know, for centuries been a centre for commerce. That is not going to change, and there are certainly going to be a lot of financial services people that want to live and work in the UK. But, uh, as I think many of the panellists have said, uh, it's going to take a long time to thrash it all out. But, given the importance of financial services to the UK, it will clearly be a priority of the government to ensure that that March deadline that's been discussed, really mm -hmm. something certain comes out of that because this is such an important sector to the British economy. Klaus, in just a few weeks, the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson will be going to India. It's part of a reported tilt towards the Indo-Pacific by the United Kingdom. There are also ongoing discussions uh, on Britain joining the TPP. So they do have options, don't they? Where do you see this going? 
Yes, of course, the UK <laughs> has options like any other country in the world has options. And of course, also the UK will survive, um, will survive Brexit, but it will be poorer and it will be less relevant in the world. And that is a, a sad thing about it. I think we, we are painting a little bit of a very nice picture here. At the moment, you know, the UK is an absolute chaos. Uh, it, there's a deep uh, recession, there's a lockdown, which is going to be uh, at least until mid-February. The uh, 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 vaccine rollout has become a disaster, which is not as going forward as efficiently as it should be. So there is a, 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 a dire crisis situation at the moment in the UK, unfortunately, of course. And we have two double whammies. We have the, the exit from the EU and we have the pandemic. And this is a severe crisis. So Johnson really is in the very uh, difficult waters. Hopefully he can sort it out, but I wonder. And um, uh, opening up to the world, trying to re-establish better relations, economic relations with India, opening up other trade avenues is, of course, a sensible way forward. That is what uh, Johnson meant when he talked about uh, freeing himself from the EU and entering the, the world, global Britain. But it will be a difficult, uh, um, a difficult movement because our world is really moving towards yeah. giant trade blocks and giant uh, power, great power competition. You know, think of the EU, think of the United States, think of China. Yeah. These are all much bigger power blocks. And uh, Britain really uh, is not that important a country in that scenario, unfortunately. OK, I want to get to those major power blocks that you talk about, Klaus, in just a moment. But Wayne, first, your response to what Klaus just said, the UK in absolute chaos. Uh, cloud cuckoo land. Clouds, I, I live in this country. I'm here. I do not recognize any of those things that you say. You know, look, financially, the stock markets have rallied this week in terms of that financial center. We are now providing more services outside of the EU in terms of financial. The, 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 the trade in Europe has declined year on year. It is not the power base you think it is. The rest of the world is the global nation of traders. There is more trade there than there is in the EU. You know, our trade deficit, and you mentioned it last time, so I did look, look it up. It's, it's 80 million in 2019 and a surplus of 52 million with non-EU countries. The, the EU rely more on Britain than the other way around. Britain is a thriving nation. Now, look, we have a pandemic, and that is an unfortunate situation the world finds itself in. Mm. But this country is ahead of the game. We are rolling out those vaccinations. We are doing it quicker than anybody else. We have vaccinated so many people. We got a new vaccine came out on Monday. We are leading the world here, as we've always done. We are a confident nation that will go forward to the rest of the world. That's how I see the UK, not as downbeat as you might portray. All right, Garrett Martin, let's talk about those big power blocks. Uh, let's talk about the future relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States. And we know that Boris Johnson and Donald Trump have a very good relationship, but Donald Trump's only going to be in office for a few more weeks, and then Joe Biden takes over. And he's already told us that his team will be reviewing parts of the trade agreement that have already been agreed to with the United States. How important is this trade deal for the UK? I would say it's, symbolic. it's more important symbolically than economically, in my view. I don't think by the models and predictions that we have seen so far that the added value of this trade of this trade agreement, if it happens, would be substantial. However, I would say symbolically, it could help cement this idea of global Britain, which has so far I think has been more, to be fair, a slogan than a clear articulation of what a UK foreign policy will look post-Brexit. But again, trade agreements, as we know, are fraught with difficulties. Mm -hmm. uh, they're complicated. They take time. Uh, you know, the issues are well known that are the obstacles over access to the food market, over pharmaceuticals. Uh, these are difficult in themselves, but I think in an era with a pandemic and concerns about supply chains, I think that could be even more difficult. So, you know, I, I think that's going to be a good, and I think it's going to be a good test for the broader question of where does the UK see itself going in the next few years? I don't want to take either a pessimistic or optimistic view as portrayed by Wayne or, or Klaus. But I think it's fair that in an era marked by economic difficulties, the UK is going to have to make, like other powers, some painful choices about what it prioritizes and why. Helen, one other thing, and this is from a sort of geopolitical uh, perspective. 
does the United Kingdom and Europe now have to repair their relationship, to rebuild their relationship? You know, as I said earlier on, this, this negotiation was very long. It was very acrimonious at times. It was bitter as well. Well, if you really want to look back in the history books, of course, there have been very acrimonious relationships uh, between many of the countries of Europe and the United Kingdom. Indeed, referencing back to the union of the United Kingdom, there has been historical arguments between Scotland and England for centuries. Um, I think the thing here is, is to pick up on uh, the point that the last uh, panellist made, which is to do with how um, this is going to take uh, a long time to play out. Britain does need to try and position itself as to what global Britain actually means. Uh, and um, relationships between powers shift all the time. And it depends a lot about the character of the people leading them. And I think one thing we should look at here is, yes, there is, of course, a new president coming in in the US, but there will always be the special relationship between yeah. our two countries. But more importantly, Germany has an election uh, towards the end of this year, and next year it, there's a big one in France. So even the big players in the EU, the direction of the European Union could be mm -hmm. quite different, and that could indeed uh, really affect the relationship between the EU and the UK, depending on, of course, who wins. Uh, Wayne, one other thing about the UK's place in the world. There are critics who say that uh, the United Kingdom, having left the European Union, will now lose its, its international clout. Uh, it will be less relevant, more insular. I, I don't buy into that argument, you know, which is why so many people want to come to this country, why so many people want to trade here, why we've been the centre of finance, why we've been the centre of trade for centuries. Why will that change? We're going out into the world. I know that, you know, our, our foreign office and our trade teams, just look how many trade deals that Liz Truss has done already in such a short space of time. People said it wouldn't be possible. You know, everything is possible if you apply yourself to the problem. And that's what we've always done. And I don't want to hear claims of, you know, harking back to empire. We're innovators. We've yeah. always been. And I don't see why that would change. People want to buy from us. People want our tech. They want our scientists. And none of that will change. I am, uh, you know, a glass half full man. Yeah. And I think, you know, our place in the world is established and will remain so. Gareth, the uh, Washington Post uh, ran a piece recently in which it talked about, well, it talked about winners and losers. But in the winning column, it had the Republic of Ireland. How do you see it? Well, I'm, you know, full disclosure, I am an Irish citizen, so I want to be careful and be clear about that, that I would, did not disagree with that assessment. I think Ireland has been one of the victors for a variety of reasons. One is, if you look back at the four years of negotiations, you know, Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, was very proactive in making sure that the Irish question was at the forefront yeah. of the EU negotiating position. So in, the, in, in itself, I think that was, they were very successful uh, in doing so. Um, you know, second, I, I would also say that the, you know, Ireland and the Republic of Ireland has been able to push or put the question of Irish reunification back on the table softly. I, I certainly would not want to suggest that this is going to happen anytime soon or immediately, yeah. but it has put the question on the table in a way that for many years it was more of an Well, actually, Garrett, Sinn Féin is saying this is going to happen within the next 10 years. That's... That's possible. I, I think one important element, and I would you know, emphasize two major points about why that is certainly possible. One is that de facto, you know, one of the key consequences of the Brexit deal is that you have a separation between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom when it comes right. to regulations. So, and Northern Ireland is in a bit in the EU and in, in, the, in the Republic of Ireland's economic orbit. Number two, I think you do see some demographics are also important. The demographics in Northern Ireland are slowly changing, but they will be a Catholic majority soon. That doesn't mean it's automatically going to lead to uh, you know, support for reunification. And if reunification happens, it would have to be carefully planned. But I think it's also forcing the people in the, in the Republic itself to think about whether it is something that they right. want. I think the heart says yes. But the head is a bit more uncertain. I mean, there would be a cost to reunification. Uh, the Republic is a more economic pr prosperous than, than Northern Ireland. Right. And so they would have to think. Can I, can I come into here as well? Yes, in a moment, Klaus. Okay, go ahead, Gareth. 
Yeah, yeah, just to finish, I mean, I think the, the example of Germany suggests that reunification, the costs of reunification are, you know, are born for many, many years yeah. afterwards. So I think, yes, there's some support for this idea, but it's something that even in the Republic, I think they would tread carefully before rushing into it. Okay, go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I think there were certain developments uh, in Ireland which were leading towards a gradual merging uh, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland anyway, particularly as uh, Garrett rightly said, demographic development. But that, of course, has been speeded up by Brexit because the majority of the Northern Irish people actually wanted to stay in the EU. So they are very disappointed with the developments and the leaving uh, and the departure of the UK from the EU. Also, that new border, that new kind of custom border, whatever you want to call it, between Northern Ireland and Britain, that will have an impact. So I do believe that uh, uh, the whole process, the whole Brexit process will speed up uh, Irish unification. Right. Wayne, I have one final question for you, and this has got very little to do with Brexit. Uh, mm -hmm. You're also a local cabinet member for health and social care. Prime Minister Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom has just announced oh, a new lockdown or a re-lockdown because of the new variant strain of COVID. Um, what do you make of that decision and uh, what do you expect will come from the lockdown? It's from my, it's only a personal perspective. Um, my view is uh, that I would have closed schools. There was no doubt about that. I agree that we should be in lockdown. And I'm one of the people that's thinking, you know, if it takes eight weeks, 10 weeks, that's what it is. We have the hope of the vaccine on the horizon in terms of that rollout. Mm -hmm. So I agree entirely. The government, you know, is in a very difficult position trying to balance the economy of the country, people's jobs, people's mental health, uh, you know, childcare. All these things matter and they're important. But it's such a traumatic thing to be going through in any country. You know, and we've lost over 75,000 people in this country. It's serious. And, you know, I just... I'm praying and hoping as each week goes by, we vaccinate as many people as we can and we can get back to some kind of normality in the world and, you know, visit our friends in Europe again. And that's where we have to leave it. Uh, thanks to all of you who've been with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us.